So I'm just going to give a bunch of different quick case examples um, and a couple uh, different topics. And I think we've discussed this. I mean, there are lots of keys to success. Uh, and I've sort of, in my mind, there's four components when I discuss with my fellows. First is really assess risk, right? And that, that means just the CTA, right? And look at it carefully. Whoever's doing the procedure needs to look at it. You can't get a CTA report and then do a TAVI procedure. You need to look at where is the bifurcation? How deep is the bifurcation? Where is the calcium? Where is the tortuosity? Really assess risk and have that conversation with the patient regarding risk. And then prepare based on what you your risk assessment. Am I going to go, as we discussed earlier, radial femoral, bilateral femoral? Uh, am I going to pro-star, per-close? Uh, those are all important considerations. And then be very meticulous. I think Peter went through a very nice sort of approach of ultrasound guided access, you know, meticulous access, uh, you know, in the common femoral, uh, you know, at a point that's compressible where there's minimal calcium, right? There are a lot of times patients have calcium along the entire length and you want to hit the point where there isn't calcium because that increases the likelihood that your closure will be successful. And then if you do have complications, manage them and manage them percutaneously and try and avoid any sort of surgical approach, if at all, if they can be managed percutaneously. And I think that's to have that experience. Uh, and we've talked about it. When you're assessing risk, it's about vessel size. And this is an old paper, but it's still relevant. That sheath to femoral artery ratio above 1.05, vessels will dilate a little. If they're atherosclerotic, they won't dilate as much. But if, if you have too big a sheath and too small a vessel, your risk of vascular complication goes up. But as, as we've seen from cases, you can do vessels down to four, but you, you have to be prepared to stent and manage any sort of vascular complication. Early on, I would not push the limits. I mean, I, early on, ideally, these are the cases you do. Minimal tortuosity, minimal calcium, and good vessel size. But obviously not everyone is like that. And you really, the two things that I worry about the most is tortuosity and calcium. For example, on the left here, if you can see my pointer, this degree of calcium and this degree of tortuosity will make it hard for the sheath to go. And I'll show you a core valve case coming up where that became an issue. On the right side with the calcium without tortuosity, I'd feel more comfortable. So, you know, although the femoral access site here is less calcified, if you think it's reasonable to get into the right femoral, the iliac is more favorable than, but the common femoral is more favorable on the left. So you're going to take trade-offs and you have to look at carefully and assess in this particular patient, which trade-off am I going to compromise? The femoral artery access site and just put a covered stent? Or am I going to try and get through this calcified uh, thing? So in terms of vascular access, uh, you know, managing it, optimal vascular access, we've discussed the components, careful review the CT, ultrasound guided access, and, and angiography. Talk a little bit about a pre-close and talk, uh, what we haven't talked much about in, in the crossover wire. And I think early on, I think everybody should do a crossover wire. I know there's some proponents that don't believe in the crossover wire. And what we mean by a crossover wire is if your large sheath is on the right side, when you get the sheath on the left side, you cross over with an 014 wire from the left femoral artery into the right SFA. Um, it, it allows you to manage complications and I'll show you examples of how we do that. Um, and also, you know, for people that don't do a lot of femoral or peripheral intervention, it allows them to gain wire skills in the in peripheral intervention. And for uh, access, it gives you an additional landmark for your arterial puncture. So this is what we do. We have a, a six French contralateral and we put an 014 wire through the six French contralateral uh, down into the SFA. And I cross over with an IMA, you can use whatever you want, Omniflush, rim catheter, but into the SFA. So, and then I just leave that coming out of that sheath and that and I put my five French pigtail for my angiography through that same six French sheet. So that sheet that I was gonna use for my uh, pigtail, I just put an 014 wire. You can get access but it gives you another landmark when you're sticking fluoroscopically there. And then I do pre-closure. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Just give- Yeah. Uh, but uh, I do, okay, I do pre-closure and I do two proglides typically. Um, I put them that same 10 and two o'clock position. And the idea is to create uh, sort of a X-shaped closure for, for when the sheath comes out. So you deploy the proglides, you leave the knots out and you pre-close, but you don't tie the knots. And so early on when we were using, you know, 22 and 24 French sheaths, what we did is we, as we took the sheath out, we brought a balloon from the other side over the 014 wire. The advantage is if there's any sort of bleeding, you quickly inflate the balloon, minimize blood loss, 
um, and, and we size that balloon to the external iliac. Um, and, the, and then on the back end of the balloon, I put a TUI, right? Because it's an 014 wire and this balloon is designed for an 032 wire, you can still inject through the balloon lumen uh, and, and do angiography. And so you know, early on with the big sheets, I don't do this anymore. We used to inflate the balloon to stop blood flow and remove the delivery sheath and tie the new, uh, sutures. The rationale for this in the beginning was, you know, when a vascular surgeon is tying knots, the vessel's decompressed. And when the vessel's decompressed, it's easier to deliver the knots. The one thing I will emphasize, whether you use the balloon, whether you do crossover or not, a completion angiogram is a must in every case. There are a lot of times you'll find things that you wouldn't know unless you did a completion angio that will prevent, that, that will present later with a, more of a major vascular complication. If you can identify things early, it's better to er identify early and manage early. And those can be dissections, occlusions, pseudoaneurysms. So you need to do a completion angio in every case. So the things I want to sort of talk about, you know, a lot of these elderly patients, there's other things besides the iliac. Abdominal aortic tortuosity is, is a problem. Um, and you see this in a lot of these older patients with kyphoscoliosis. And you see here that the sheath kink, this is the BAV, 14 French BAV sheath kink. And it kinked because of this abdominal aortic tortuosity. The wire was simply not stiff enough. Um, and so in this case, um, what you, the videos aren't playing, I'm sorry, but you see this is one Meyer wire. And then on the contralateral side, I put a second Meyer wire. And you see with the two wires, it straightens. So what I do in a case like this is you have the pigtail on the other side, keep a Meyer wire in the pigtail to give support for that abdominal aorta to straighten and then put a second stiff wire, like Meyer, Lunderquist, whatever you prefer. And so, and, and so you leave this wire in the pigtail to your core valve delivery system or your Edwards delivery system, Lotus, whatever you're using, uh, gets past this tortuosity. And then once the delivery system gets past this tortuosity, you take the Meyer wire out of the pigtail, flush the pigtail and hook it up for your angiography. Um, and then again, the, see again, this, the, it's straightened very quick, easily and the sheath went up. Um, I, I, I might want to stop here. I mean, this is something that I do probably, you know, once a month. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, it just makes it easier. And because sometimes you can injure the abdominal aorta, uh, Ganesh or others. I mean, is it worth, is that pretty clear in terms of the concept? I just want to make sure people get that concept. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, was, was that pretty clear in terms of that concept? I just wanted to make sure. Yes, it did. So, yeah, okay. So the other things, this is what I was talking about. This is that tortuosity. It's this calcium and tortuosity in the uh, iliac. Um, and there's severe tortuosity, severe calcium. This becomes like a lead pipe and it won't straighten. And so this can happen if you're not careful with an uh, evolute delivery system. Um, you know, the, the wire was not stiff enough. And you see here the capsule separating. Um, and I think the scenarios here are several approaches. One, the vessel size was big enough. You can just say, okay, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to put a big sheath. Uh, you can put an 18 French sheath and deliver everything through an 18 French sheath. And that way you avoid this issue. Or you over capture the capsule. You clockwise it and, and you make it stiffer at the tip by over capturing the capsule. Or, or you put a stiffer wire. But I think you just have to be careful when this is happening that, you, you know, that you're watching on fluoro. That's why you never push without watching on fluoro. So finally, you know, you, you can have issues happen, but you have to be, uh, how do you bail out? Um, and you need to make sure you have the appropriate catheters and wires. You have to have appropriate occlusion balloons. You have to be comfortable with peripheral stents, uh, both self-expanding and balloon expandable and aortic endografts. And the choice of technique will depend on the nature. So the reason I like balloon here, you know, you see an example, uh, you see this is a higher stick. Must have, we must have had eye stick. This is the top of the femoral head. Um, you see our, this is the sheath that's come out. This is our crossover wire, which is down into the SFA. And we'd left our balloon here. And this angiography is done through the balloon. And what you see here is we didn't see a lot of bleeding coming out, but this is a high stick. All of this is retroperitoneal. So we don't see much bleeding, but if you let this go, this is going to be a pretty big retroperitoneal hematoma. Um, and so what we do here is advance the balloon across the arteriotomy. Um, and, and we try balloon tamponade to start. And if that doesn't work, then, then we're in a case like this in a high risk person, I would just stent this to prevent a, a major retroperitoneal bleed. 
if you know, but initially I would do an inflated balloon for five minutes and make sure it, it looks okay. But if not, then I got to stent it. So I, I, I inflate the balloon at the site of the arteriotomy. I take out the O14 and I put a super core. Then I, I remove the balloon and the contralateral sheath while someone's trying their best to maintain hemostasis manually. And then we upsize the sheath. Um, and now we use the VBX covered stent. Uh, and that goes through a seven French. I usually put a seven French destination, in this case, from the right side all the way over the horn into the left common iliac. And then I advance a VBX. The advantage of a VBX is it, it can go grow in many different sizes. It's flexible because these coils are not interlinked and it's a covered stent. So you balloon expand it. And through a seven French, you can go from a nine millimeter VBX. You can take it all the way up to 12 millimeters uh, in this type of scenario. And so inflate the VBX and I take a look, I post dilate, do completion angio, and you see here that there, there's no, uh, no bleeding here. So another example, um, this is a patient with pretty good vascular access. We, you know, we don't expect a complication. We did a balloon expandable valve and we do a completion angio from the other side and you see what happened here. There's an occlusive dissection. You don't see bleeding. And probably what happened is the perclose knot caught the back end or the sheath created a small dissection that we then closed with the per close. So, and, and this is a case where we had not done a crossover wire and I don't recall why, but we got a wire across the dissection. We did a small angio, we inflated, uh, we advanced a wire and, and then uh, put inflated a balloon, just a balloon. And you see here, just with the balloon, we tacked up the dissection well. Um, we didn't need to put a stent uh, and it was fine. And so. If you don't do a completion angio, you don't notice that until later when the foot is cold and then it becomes much more of an issue. And finally, crossover balloon also allows you to salvage from potentially catastrophic complications. This was an external iliac rupture. So you can either from the ipsilateral side or the contralateral side, inflate a balloon in the common iliac. The key thing is to gain maintain, you know, gain hemostasis. So we had a crossover, uh, we put a, we had a balloon over the crossover wire in the common iliac, which we inflated to gain hemostasis. And through the large sheet side of the ipsilateral wire, I put a covered stent. And this was basically one of those calcified vessels that uh, Sai had shown that we basically ruptured in advancing the sheet. And so we put a covered stent via the ipsilateral side, and then I removed the sheath, tied the per closes, and you see here, able to rescue a catastrophic complication, but that was because we had the crossover wire to gain hemostasis, put a covered stent this side, and then closed it. I won't go through this. People talked about, you can do the crossover from the radial. And I think that's been discussed earlier on the chat. But if there's any major complication, just put an aortic occlusion balloon. The priority in these scenarios have to be maintain, getting hemostasis uh, or gaining control. Uh, because what, if the hemodynamics are crashing, the patient's bleeding a lot, you can't do it. In this case, there was an external iliac avulsion early on. This was with the 24 French sheets. Um, and we used an aortic occlusion balloon. Um, this is, I show this because this is why I put those two stiff wires. You know, this is, you see what's happening here. The abdominal aorta is tortuous uh, and the, sh the sheath is pushing into the wall of the aorta as the catheter comes out. And the patient became very hypotensive and basically we had ruptured the abdominal aorta. Um, and, we, and we had to put a coda balloon and put a, put a covered stent and we were able to rescue with an endograft. But the patient lost a lot of blood. He ended up getting a total of eight units of blood during that hospitalization. He survived, left without renal failure, but those are things to keep in mind. And finally, I want to, we talked a little bit, and I'll go quickly because I only have two minutes left here, with about lithotripsy. Um, and we've been using the shockwave more since it's become available in the U.S. Um, and I think it does have advantage. Uh, as Ganesh said, it works best in circumferential calcified vessels. But even in the ones like Sai showed, I've had pretty good results. And this is an example of patient, this is circumferential heavy circumferential calcium. This is once where the, you, know, you, you can try to push the sheath, but there's resistance along the entire length. So we, we did a shockwave with a six millimeter shockwave balloon. That, that's usually plenty. And then you see the sheath went up really easy. We, we had tried initially without shockwaving it and the sheath just got stuck. So. Um, this is one where we did shockwave and it went up nicely. And then in the end, um, it, the final closure went fine. So it was an event. It's a case that I think without shockwave, could you have done? Yes, we could have done aggressive balloon. But with that degree of circumferential calcium, my experience as shockwave has worked a lot better. In terms of vascular access, I think ProGlide is the most. Manta is approved, but it has its pros and cons as well. 
think you have to get experience. And I think that's the comment that you need to do femoral cases that are six French and seven French and eight French before you start doing a lot of 14. So don't make femoral access only in that scenario. So key things is back as before, you know, assess, pay meticulous attention to vascular access and closure, become comfortable with percutaneous closure, you know, predict complications, be ready to deal with them with endovascular techniques. If you're not familiar with it, have people in the room that are familiar with it, have the equipment available. And I would say for all early sites, and even, you know, I do crossover balloon in every case still. I think it's part of his training for fellows, but I think there are always ones where you can't uh, predict. And I think the cost is pretty low with just placing a small wire. And right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, I just have one thing to mention about Sushil's talk, um, especially that case you showed Sushil. I mean, all your cases are fabulous. You know, every time you put a presentation up, Sushil, it's only then I'm able to wrap my head around the sheer volume of cases that you've done. The patient in whom you are showing where the abdominal aorta tortuosity was there, uh, it, it just makes me so uncomfortable to see that sharp bend in the nose cone. So when when even it starts getting to something like that, I like to have a Landerquist in the in the delivery system, and I like to have a pigtail with a Landerquist also, which kind of helps to um, to straighten the iota. Uh, but I mean, I guess you'll have to be really experienced to know when exactly to stop. Sushil, do you want to comment a little more on on that? No, I, I agree. I mean, I think it, it's hard um, to know. Um, I think uh, the um, the, the, ch the challenges are that you know you 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 if you sort of going against a bend and and there's a lot of thrombus or other things in that abdominal aorta, you may get up for the procedure, but then you may embolize plaque or thrombus down to the leg and create you know a cold foot. So you know obviously we, we we're not seeing it, you know when you look at some of these aortas and pathology, it's amazing we get away with as much as we do. Um, and so I think trying to be cautious, not pushing hard. And I think that was a great point that we probably didn't emphasize enough. And, you know, Ganesh said it, you know, that he listens to the patient when he's pushing. If the patient hurt, feels something, then to stop because something's happening and there, there's a lot that's going on. So I think we do have to be a little bit cautious. I think in tortuous abdominal aortas, I put the two stiff wires. Uh, I, I don't wait till I have difficulty because I'm worried that I'm going to injure the abdominal aorta and maybe not catastrophically, but I may embolize the leg, I may embolize the kidney and other things. So I just go ahead and put the two stiff. If there's not a lot of that tortuosity, I don't do that. Uh, but I, but I, I have a low threshold to do that. 